What is up guys, Karma Medic here, and welcome back to another dose. In this video, me and Ali have sat down and answered a whole bunch of questions that you guys sent over to us on Instagram. So this is actually the second part of a two part video. The first part is up on Ali's channel, so make sure you guys click and watch that after this is done. Okay, next question from Muhammad underscore Sawas. How did you find each other in reality? That was a good hat on the Muhammad. Yeah, I, guess. yeah I, am, I am actually. It's Arab. almost like you speak Arabic, yeah. yeah. <laughs> no, Ali's been absolutely great with me today. We went out for lunch with a couple of his friends and it's been a pleasure. Yeah, man. I wanted to do a collab with you for a while. And True. When? We haven't been able to make this happen for quite yeah. some time. We wanted to do it pre-COVID. Yeah, and then COVID um, happened. Then COVID happened. And then the US Assembly happened. Yeah. For me and like, yeah. <laughs> and I was like, oh, you're free now. Down. I'm free this weekend. Do you want to come down? Yeah, we're just chilling. Yeah. Having a good time. It's been great. All that stuff. Question from Bonolo underscore M underscore tips for someone who's camera shy but wants to start a YouTube channel. I feel like you're going to say something nice and I'm going to say something mean. The main thing I'm going to say. I am going to say something nice. <laughs> like, every, everyone thinks that they're camera shy. Camera sh being camera shy is a natural state of affairs. No one is born being able okay. to look at a camera and talk to it and like rant at it. If you want to start a YouTube channel, but you think you're camera shy, recognize that this is a skill and like everything else in, in life is a skill that you can work on and get better at. I hated talking to a camera for the first few months of being on YouTube. I'm sure you did as well. Like yep. this, it's, it's not a thing. You just get better at it. And it is possible to make a successful YouTube channel without showing your face. True. It's a hell of a lot harder to do. With voiceovers yeah. and like B-roll and People stuff. People like yeah, Wendover true. Productions, Kurtz Gesagt, CDP Grade, they don't show the faces, but it's really, really hard to get to that level where you're mm -hmm. so pro, where the content and the story and the Tells informational itself. is so good that you don't need to show your face. That's it's true. It's so hard to do. I wouldn't recommend it. I was going to say something very similar to you. So oh, that, was really? actually, that was actually oh, very no. nice. I, I think that was great advice. Like yeah. everyone, when they pick up a camera, are camera shy. And I'm camera shy till this day. I still need a little bit of time to warm up to it. So mm. it is, like you said, recognize that it's a skill like anything else. You can learn to speak more eloquently in front of a camera and go back to any of our earlier videos. Like you will notice how differently we speak to a camera. Hi, my name is Nasser Karma. I'm 22 years old and I want to start making YouTube videos. Hey YouTube, how's it going? I'm back for video number two on my channel. Video number three, video number four. What's up guys, Karma Medic here. Welcome back to another dose. So it's something that you get over with time. Same with vlogging in public. Practice, practice, practice. So hard practice makes public. perfect. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's still a Man, challenge. I'm, I'm sweating enough just doing this. If this were in public, oh God. This is a fun question from Bruno Wegelius. How mm -hmm. has having multiple income streams impacted your lives as medical students? So for me, it's just enabled me to make purchases that I otherwise would have never done before. Mm -hmm. Like for example, yesterday I bought this Apple Watch Series 6. Oh nice, I've still got like, a Series 4 man. All right, yeah. <laughs> you must be balling. <laughs> so like this literally came out a couple of days ago yeah. and I didn't even have to think that hard about it. I was like, this is something that I think will be beneficial in my life. I could make some videos on it. I want to get it and so I did. Whereas before, like I would have never even considered getting an Apple Watch. It's not a necessity in my life. It's not something that I need in order to be productive or anything like that. So yeah, it's enabled me to make decisions like that. The other cool thing is that, so in, in my case, uh, a lot of the purchases that I can make uh, are business expenses. So cameras, microphones, lights, laptop, screen. Like almost every piece of tech I buy is as a business expense. And when you have it as a business expense, you essentially don't pay tax on it like three times over. And so you kind of get it half price. I've got a video mm -hmm. talking about this more in depth coming out at some point. I think, yeah, having that business and having that business make money, it's just like so helpful because like, you know, like you said, if like a new iPad comes out, I will just buy it, no questions asked. And mm -hmm. that's, you know, a really fortunate and privileged position to be in. Definitely. which is what you get when you start a business and have multiple streams of income. And you can get there by following my video about how to make money online. Three levels of blah, blah, blah. Linked in the video description and up there. <laughs> Plug emoji. Plug emoji. All right, we've got a question from Ikra Hussain who says, do you ever have days where you just CBA laugh emoji? I think I have parts of days where I just CBA. Mm. Generally, when I wake up in the morning, I like will get out of bed because I'm already thinking about what the first thing I want to do is after breakfast. And so I generally just start doing things that are on my to-do list. I do have times where I CBA and then I'll just sit down and watch some YouTube videos or like go procrastinate and talk to my sister or whatever. But full days where I CBA, I think is pretty rare for me. Yeah, same for me. Like I think when, when you're a beginner to the productivity thing, you have to really decouple what you feel like doing from what you're actually doing. Because what, you, what you're gonna feel like doing is just watching Netflix all day or something stupid like that. And if you wanna start a YouTube channel or be consistent or start a business with anything, you need to use discipline to overcome that barrier between the thing I feel like doing is not the thing that I know I should be doing. For me now, I'm at the point where actually, if I just do what I feel like doing at any given moment, things are probably gonna be all right. And it is something productive probably anyway. Yeah, it probably is. Like occasionally I'll sit on the on, on the couch and just scroll through Instagram completely unproductively. Or TikTok. Or TikTok. <laughs> in, in, <laughs> in your case. case, in your case, yeah. If you're working on something that you really enjoy, like 
these YouTube channels that we're working on, then it doesn't really feel like work. It doesn't feel like a chore. It doesn't feel like effort. It's something that I want to do anyway. And yeah, maybe I'm not bothered at this specific time, but then I'll just tell myself, okay, fine, I'll take a break for an hour and then I will do it. And then it gets done after that. All right, we've got a cool question from Linky h 2 zz or something like that. He says, how do I gain confidence? I'm third year and feeling like I know nothing, can't diagnose and feeling insecure. Okay, so I guess there's kind of two strands. There's confidence generally, and there's like domain specific confidence. Confidence specifically, so in any field, whether that's medicine or law or anything, for me, the only way I can see myself overcoming a weakness or not being confident in something is by practicing that exact thing that I'm not good at or researching how I can become better at it. Especially in medical school, the times when I've learned the most and grown the most is when I've been put in a really uncomfortable situation, when I really didn't want to take that history or I really didn't want to practice this clinical skill, but I was told to and I was like, okay, it's time to actually do this now. That's when I learned the most. And I think don't be scared of failure. A lot, I think a lot of people put too much emphasis on failure. If I ever fail at something or if I do bad at something, like that's completely okay. I'm, I'm fine with not being good at things. Everyone is not good at things. And I think it's like what you take from that experience and how you move forward, which is important, as opposed to the act of failing. Everyone fails multiple times a day. It's completely fine. And I don't think we should put so much emphasis on it. Yeah, absolutely. There's a, a nice phrase that competence breeds confidence. You can't be confident at like surgery unless you're competent at surgery. And you shouldn't try and be confident in surgery unless you're competent at it. So work on the skill first and over time you'll become more confident. I think also there is a school of thought because like when, when I was in school, I wasn't very confident at all. And I kind of read a lot of books about this and watched a lot of videos and stuff about how to become more confident. Okay. Um, and I came across a book which was called like The Wrongless Approach. It was written by this like magician, hypnotist, pickpocket kind of performer guy. And he was talking about how to become more confident at doing ballsy things like going up to someone, like stealing their watch without them noticing, stuff like that. That okay. requires a large degree of confidence as you put your hands away. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Before they a large degree of confidence. And he was saying that the thing that changed it for him is that you realize that, that there's no real difference between real confidence and fake confidence. Instead of treating confidence as like this a sort of magical power that we have to acquire over time, you can just choose one day to flip your mind into thinking that, okay, I'm a confident person and I'm going to pretend to act as, as a confident person would and no one else from the outside would be able to tell that you're faking confidence mm -hmm. as opposed to you're actually confident. And so certainly when I'm on camera, I certainly, I, I, I hope that I look that I'm confident, but I am faking it. I'm pretending to be, I'm pretending to act like a confident person would, and no one can tell the difference. And that's the thing with like generalized confidence versus specific confidence. I think specific confidence, domain specific confidence is built on a background of competence, but general confidence is a skill that you can just choose. It's like, it's like a mindset that you can choose to embody if you want. Do you disagree? I don't think I disagree. I just think that's probably hard for a lot of people mm. who aren't confident to sort of flip that switch. Mm. I mean, even for me, like when I'm put in uncomfortable situations in a group of people who I don't know, for example, like I am naturally more nervous and my voice will crack more than it normally does. Okay. And as much as I pretend that I'm, I'm confident, uh, it doesn't always work. I think for me, again, it just comes down to exposure. Yeah. But obviously every, there's so many different ways that people overcome these types of things. Um, but for me, yeah, exposure sort of triumph, triumphs everything. So we've got a question here from Akshay Singh six two five three, and they ask how to grow your audience. I think I think we think very similar things with mm. this because I've heard you talk about this, and I could not possibly agree more. I think at the very beginning, especially when I started making videos, no one cares about who Nasser is. Nobody even knows who Nasser is. The only thing people care about is that you are telling them something of value. You're giving them some point that they can take away, that they can write down, that can help improve their life in some way, shape, or form. And so all my beginning videos were trying to give out information, trying to give value to the people who were watching. And even though I wanted to do more vlog type content, lifestyle type content, I always told myself, nobody cares right now because no one knows who I am. No one knows about my personality, what I do like, what I don't like. And so there wasn't really as much of a point making those videos because why would somebody watch that about me if they don't know who I am? First provide the value, gain your audience from that, and then you can start to experiment in different streams. Yeah, man, value, lead with value. People don't care about you, they care about the value you give to them. And so the way to grow your audience is by just giving them loads and loads of value, doing it for free. I've got this like three part formula. I'm gonna make a video about this. It's like build your audience. Number one, take notes, provide value. Number two, do it for free once a week. And three, do it for two years. Mm. If you can do that, if you can actually do all those things, create valuable content, put it out for free once a week and do it for two years, you will have an audience. You're basically guaranteed to do it. It's just that no one who asks that question who like actually does, the, does, does all three of those things. I completely, I completely agree. The biggest thing I think is people can't do it for two years. Mm. Like I just reached the point now, I was looking at my analytics yesterday and for half the time my YouTube channel has existed, I have had nobody watching my videos, like 50 to 100 people watching. 
for half the time my channels existed. And then the second half is what you guys are used to and what you guys are seeing, I guess. So it takes a long time for people to find you, for people to become accustomed to you, people to like you, people to share your stuff. And the difficulty is sticking through it for that long period of time. And I feel like that's where most people fail. If you do stick with it, I genuinely think you're guaranteed to have an audience. You're guaranteed yeah. to have people who care about you. There's enough people who watch these videos, enough people who share them and they have friends and they can tell their friends, like it's bound to happen just given enough time. Okay, so we've got a question from Zach Hiley who says, do you have a 10 year plan? Uh, so short answer to that is no, I don't have a 10 year plan. I don't even really have a five year plan. I think- uh, Barely have a one year plan. <laughs> yeah, no, exactly. Like, <laughs> um, I think like the future is so uncertain. Like, you know, for, for us, like two years ago, like a year ago, we went, like n neither of us would have had any idea about the impact that our YouTube channels would have on our lives and how it'll kind of change things moving forward. Every Everything changes so rapidly that to have any kind of plan just seems to, to me to be a bit of a waste of time. I get that some people say that it, it is useful to do the exercise anyway, just because mm -hmm. then you really f figure out what, what do you actually want and try and imagine what you'll feel like when you get there and, and stuff. So maybe there's value in it, but yeah. at the moment I haven't really done the 10 year planning extensively. I very much agree with what you said and I think like having goals is something that's obviously very important, but I talked about this in one of the recent videos I posted about how I studied so long mm. for six months for the step one exam. And the last thing I said in that video was that I try and always focus on what's directly in front of me. And I don't think too far ahead, I don't try and overcomplicate things because then it's just, it's overwhelming and it's stressful. The more I, I can focus on what's directly in front of me, the better of a job I can do at that. So I have goals that I want to achieve in life, but they're sort of these vague, big things that I'm going to eventually reach in the future if I just keep up doing what I'm doing. What are the goals you want to achieve in life? want to become a doctor okay first and foremost uh you know have a family like all the standard things okay. I, I don't really have anything like out there but yeah, yeah fair enough kind of the same for me except i want to become a gymshark athlete <laughs> true so you're on your way there you're not wearing the t-shirt though i'm not wearing the t-shirt no. <laughs> well, you've got to you've got to wrap the brand <laughs> yeah, yeah, abercrombie and fish <laughs> not sponsored question from yno pill la pill says best collab exclamation mark uh what do you think you both have in common that led to your success one of the things that we have in common is that we're willing to put in the work over long periods of time, even if it isn't something that is easy mm. or something that's beneficial right now, but we know that it could be in the future. I think where a lot of people might get bored or give up or lose faith, we would be willing to push through that. Yeah, I think the consistency is definitely a big part of it. I think also like the formula for success is sort of putting in hard work, but then multiplying it by unfair advantages. Certainly the unfair advantage that we both have is that we're both medics. That is immediately an unfair advantage because there are so many medical students, That's medical true. applicants looking for medical content. The other unfair advantage is that we're both a certain level of privileged whereby we could have just decided that, you know, I want to start a YouTube channel. It wasn't the case that I, I imagine for you, we had to sort of work a sort of uh, a, a job in like a shop or something like some of my friends had to do during the summer to make ends meet, that kind of thing. We were like sufficiently privileged to mm -hmm. be able to put in the graph for two years while not really getting much success and continue to kind of plug away at it. So I think there are those unfair advantages. Some people would say we're we're both guys, we're both reasonably well-spoken. Like all, all of these things are complete complete accidents that we had nothing right, to do with. Come together, yeah. That come true. together nicely to give this package of unfair advantages. And then you just multiply that with hard work and consistency and stuff. And then that's the formula. <laughs> and then sprinkle in some luck. Sprinkle in some luck, exactly. Yeah, luck, luck yeah. plays such a huge part in it. Like Right place, yeah. right time. Yeah. Especially with the videos doing well or like going big. Exactly, really like important. there's no way to predict a certain video going big, but it's like, you know, there's a thing that Gary Vee says, which is that it just takes one piece of content to change your life. You just never know which one that's going to be. That's a good quote. And so, you know, I've, I was plugging away videos. It, it it took me like, I don't know, 70 videos to get to a, a, few, a few thousand subscribers. You probably got there a lot sooner. It took me a year and a bit before yeah. my first video took off. Oh, okay. Yeah, what was that, what was that video time. that took off? It was a medical school vlog, final, oh, final yeah, exam. That, medical that vlog. did ridiculously well. It did. <laughs> like, how it did it do did. so well? I have no idea. <laughs> And Some of my videos as well. Changed like, my life. You know, so, the ones that, that like have zillions of hours of research that go into them, might not, might your, not do as well. Your how to type fast video that yeah. like absolutely Some, blew up. Yeah, like for the first few days, it was on six out of 10 on the analytics. I was thinking, oh, it's just a crappy video. Mm -hmm. And then suddenly it just absolutely blew up. And I'm like, how, you never how, know, how yeah. does this happen? So you never know. healthy dose of luck. But the, and just keep on doing what you're doing. The, the more videos you plug out, the, the, you, you churn out, the, the, the luckier you get. All right, so we've got a question from Hot Swagat who says, podcast that you would recommend for young entrepreneurs. Oh, this is a good one. Seems like it's right up your alley. Right on my alley, yeah. I'll be listening as well, because this is a good question for me. Okay, I would recommend the Indie Hackers podcast. This is a podcast where uh, they interview in independent creators who have set up internet businesses that are making money. Usually they talk about revenue figures as well, which I always like that, for example, he, he, this is the story of how this dude who's 16 years old from 
I don't know, Mumbai made this app that's making him $2,000 a month. And that's like so interesting because he like really digs into it, like how'd you get started? How did it work, blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. And it's just so inspiring hearing these stories. And you get some people who are like, you know, some dude in America who built an app that makes him $500,000 a month. And he does basically like half an hour of work a week for it. Like it's absolutely, it's absolutely that's next crazy. level. It's so cool. Indie so, Hackers? Indie Hackers podcast. Okay. There's another podcast that's really good called My First Million which is run by the Hustle newsletter. Uh, and that talks about, you know, how people made their first million, kind of how they got started, how long it took to get there, or any tips they have along the way. You know, if they had to start again completely from scratch, how would they go about becoming a millionaire, mm -hmm. assuming they couldn't use the network and, and stuff like that. So those two are really good, Indie Hackers and My First Million for aspiring young entrepreneurs. All right, we've got a question from underscore Airmen. He says, what's the secret to a good life? Didn't think you were gonna take that question. <laughs> <laughs> Secret to a good life, balance. If, if I do too much of any one thing, then I don't feel fulfilled in my life because I get bored quite quickly. And the more you can stimulate yourself by doing new experiences or getting involved in different things, the easier it's gonna be to stay fulfilled. I like to do as many different things as I can. And that keeps me happy. Yeah, man, fully agree. I think having a full-time job is never gonna be fun mm -hmm. because you're kind of stuck doing one thing for an extended period of time. True. I think variety is really good. One thing I've started to think about a lot recently is that the secret to a good life is to find the stuff that you like doing and figure out a way of continuing to do that stuff. Certainly for me, for YouTube, like I like doing YouTube. There is no end game here. Like the end game is to continue being able to do YouTube, to keep it sustainable, to keep it fun, to keep it enjoyable. And sometimes people ask me that, oh, you know, what about, what's what's the next step? Are you gonna go on TV? I'm like, no, why the, why the hell would I wanna go on TV? Like YouTube is- everything you want, right? <laughs> exactly, it's, it's the absolute dream. And so if you can find something that, that you like doing and you can just figure out a way to keep on doing it, then I think that's, secret to a good life. All right, question from SMTAR121472, who says, is your life fulfilling? I think yes, well, I know yes, because of, I mean, fairly similarly from what I said from the last video, because I try and keep it as varied as possible. And I have these non-negotiables in my life, which mm -hmm. are things that make me happy. And I make sure that the things that make me happy are the things that I am doing on a consistent basis. And that way I try and stay on, on top of my mental health and just doing things that I enjoy. And just saying no to everything else. Like if you don't feel like hanging out with people, you can just say no. And like, I think that's completely okay or if you don't feel like going on a night out or staying out very late just stay no like you can do whatever you want it's your time it's your life don't feel obliged to make other people happy fully on board with that i feel feel fulfilled as well i think it's sort of a balance between sort of, i think i think about it in terms of happiness and meaning like happiness being am i enjoying what i'm currently <coughs> doing and stuff and meaning is am i being useful to others and i think right now i've got a good setup where i've got a large chunk of happiness and i also have a large chunk of meaning from hopefully being useful to others through these videos and stuff so yeah Pretty fulfilling life. All right, final question we've got from Kazianika who says, how to get over disappointments? This is a lot easier said than done, but I, I try to always find some sort of learning point or some sort of learning thing I can take from failure or disappointment. I think as soon as it happens, it's easy to internalize and sort of blame yourself. Like, why did I do this? This is my fault. I could have done better. I could have done X, Y, or Z. And I think it's fine to have those feelings. And in fact, it probably helps in the process of like overcoming the event. For me, time heals everything. Yeah. I let time pass and I like think about it, I talk it out with people and I try and focus on what's one thing I can do that would help avoid this next time or help improve this for me next time. Yeah, I think it's broadly similar for me. Like I think disappointment comes from this mismatch between expectations and reality or hopes and reality. And so one thing that I try, always try and do is I try and keep my, my expectations or my hopes that are outside of my control as low as possible. Mm -hmm. So for example, I know it's within my control to release two videos a week, but I know it's completely outside of my control how many views those videos get. The initial, like I can avoid avoid feelings of disappointment by not having an expectation for how many views something's gonna get because it's completely outside of my control. Having said that, when you get a video that tanks on the analytics, you do feel a sense of, ah. It does, yeah. Um, it what is my life? <laughs> oh, why is it turned out? Oh God. You're such a waste man, Ali. What's wrong with this video? Oh my God. And then I think, I, I, and then I have to do all these mental gymnastics to, I sort of feel Tim Ferriss and Gary Vee and all the stoic people sort of screaming in my head being like, no, this is not how you should think. Decouple how you're feeling from, from reality. Mm. It's fine, it's a learning experience. Look what you learned, it's outside of control. All of, the, all of these kind of mental gymnastics that I eventually have to do. And after a while, I'm like, okay, what else? It works, it one. works. Yeah. These, these mental gymnastics and changing your perspective or how you think about a situation really helps. It really does work. Emma, yeah, it's Hebb's Law. Axons that What's fire together, on? wire together. So I the more, heard that before. <laughs> oh, it's like a thing in neuro. In neuro like, okay. So the more you train thought processes, the more they become actually ingrained into mm -hmm. the new plasticity of your brain and stuff. I find that the more I, the more I think in this way, the more I'm trained and prone to thinking in that way. And all right, guys, thank you for sending in so many questions. We've definitely had fun reading and answering them. If you guys enjoyed this video, don't forget to leave a like on it and also subscribe to both of our channels. You'll find links to that in the description down below. And yeah, hopefully we'll do this again yeah, man. at some point in the future. Definitely. You'll come to London next time. I'll come to London next time. And yeah, we'll see you guys in the next one. Peace.